uh, the last session. And this time we're going to focus on long QT, which, as, as you all know, is a big interest of uh, Dr. Kranz. So, um, long QT syndrome. First of all, let's go back through our homework from last session. So, um, as a little bit of revision, this is what the type 1 Brugard ECG pattern looked like. Um, it was showing uh, at least one lead from V1 to V3 with two millimeters of J point and ST elevation, which was down sloping and followed by a negative T wave, um, as she's seen in these three on the left hand side. <clears throat> Remember, these changes might be dynamic, they're not there all the time. Sometimes we need to do things like give medications like procainamide to reveal it. On the other hand, a type two Brigada pattern, um, again, in leads V1 to V3, shows at least two millimeters of J point elevation, but the ST segment itself measured 60 millimeters post J, only needs to be half a millimeter up, and it has this saddleback appearance instead with upright or negative T waves. Um, all the causes of ST segment changes, commonly being things like myocardial infarction, left bundle block, branch block, ventricular pacing, pericarditis, or Brugada syndrome. And this crib may have been helpful for you for the homework. So let's see how we got on with the homework. All righty, let's just move that up there. Okay, so who wants to, who, who goes first? I can go. Excellent, Lord, pick the easy one. Good man, well done. I always do. So. <laughs> um, okay, what uh, abnormalities can be seen in this ECG? Uh, well, I, I detected a Bugatta type 1, Excellent. looking at uh, V1 to V3. Yep, excellent. Uh, downward uh, sloping ST elevation in, well, very good. Mostly one and two, but the, I guess a bit, of, a bit three also. Yeah, but it's very, and, uh, very and the T wave the inversion, right, in all three of them. Absolutely brilliant. So that, that's that, that's great. That's the main thing. Now, was there anything else that you could see? Uh, so, we talked about some associated yeah. some features that could be associated with Brugada syndrome. Do you remember we talked about those? So, anyone? Um, I put first degree AV block. Excellent. Boom. Very good. Absolutely. Oh. So the PR interval is longer than five small squares. And oh, uh, yes. Brugada syndrome is not infrequently associated with conduction disorders. So first degree or higher AV block and prolongation of the QRS complex. So that's excellent. Well done. Perfect. Full marks. Right, next one. Who's going to go for this? I will. Okay. Um, I, the rate is about 84. Uh, there's third degree AV block because there's no relationship to the uh, to the P to the P wave and the. Interesting. Okay. Well, we'll come we'll come back to that in a minute. <laughs> Carry on. Um, and a Brigada 2 pattern and PVCs. Okay, okay, excellent. All right, so I think some of those things I'd certainly agree with. Yep, I'd agree that we've got uh, a type 2 Brigada pattern present here in, in B3. In B3. We've got a, it looks like a, it, it looks like a right, it looks like a right bundle branch pattern, doesn't it? But this tail end is particularly broad and it looks like a, a, a type two Brigada pattern here. So yeah, I'd certainly agree with that. I'd certainly agree with the fact that you've got a PVC here. Absolutely. Now tell me about the third degree AV block. Why do you think that's the case? Um, let me just look. So let's look at uh, so let's look in a in a lead where where the where P waves are particularly clear. So does anyone remember which leads are, are most obvious for P waves generally? Two. Yeah, lead two. So let's look at lead two. So that's why they've got lead two as a rhythm strip here. So we've got a rhythm strip going along here. So let's have a look at the P waves. So we've got a P wave, a P wave. This T wave looks different here, doesn't it? It looks kind of spiky, doesn't it? Because there's a P wave at the top here. P wave, P wave. P wave. I think you could be pretty clear that that's related to that one. That one's related to that one. That one's related to that one. No P wave here because this was a PVC. P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, P QRS, P QRS. So I think 
there is a relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. I wouldn't say that that's complete AV block. So we've got sinus rhythm here. We've got a PVC. This beat comes early as well. And we've got a little bit of a pointed, pointed T wave here. So if these are premature ventricular complexes, these ones are premature atrial complexes, okay, or atrial ectopic beats, okay? So we've got sinus rhythm. We do have an AV relationship, but it's perturbed by the fact that we've got some PVC and these early atrial beats as well. That's a little bit of a tricky one to interpret the rhythm there. So good effort, but you're certainly right about it being a, um, a type 2, uh, type two regard of that. So that was, that, was, that was the main point of it. Okay, next. I can take this one. Um, so I thought that in V1 to V3, there wasn't um, two millimeters of J point elevation. Um, but there, sorry? Excellent, very good. Okay, um, and there was ST elevation in the two, three, and AVF, so the inferior leads. Um, good. Um, there was upright T waves with deep Q waves, so I thought it was um, a relatively new MI, like four to 12 hours. Very good, excellent. So yeah, I agree, it's an, so an inferior myocardial infarction pattern. Um, yep, very good, and I think Excellent. I think that's a, that's a good guess with the timing because we've got we don't have any T wave inversion here. So yep, that's that, that's possible. It could be less than twelve hours, or it could be that there's some persistent ST elevation because this is something that's really really old, and it's then there's there's an aneurysm in those areas. So you'd have to. It always helps to. There's only so much you can get from an ECT. But you're absolutely right. We've got the ST elevation here, um, uh, and it's not in 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 uh, in, in V one to V three. This is an inferior MI pattern. Very good. Full marks. Go for this one. I can take this one. Um, so I did not think that there was a um, regatta pattern in this one. In V1, you kind of get a negative T wave, but no real pattern. But there is this ST, this S this elevation right after the QRS and the S segments that looked elevated. Um, yep. And I was wondering if this might be early repolarization. Okay, so that's a yeah, that's a that's a good suggestion. So which leads? So this is we we, don't, we didn't really cover early repolarization, um, but that's a, that's a really good that's really good for identifying that we have got some ST segment changes, but it's not in the leads that are typical for a Brugada syndrome because we've got it in not just in V1 and V2, and it doesn't really have that coved appearance, does it? Uh, but we've also got it in V4 to V6, and in one, and in two, and in three. And in AVF, we've got it. We've got it almost everywhere, haven't we? Okay, so that's not typical of a Brugada pattern. Early repolarization was a good suggestion um, because you can you, you, uh, that that would tend, but you tend to see that exclusively in the lateral lead, sometimes in, in inferior as well. In fact, the other the uh, in fact, this is a patient with pericarditis with global ST segment changes in this uh, in in this saddle morphology. Uh, but what well I'm for spotting that it's not to regard us. That was the um, that 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 was the main thing. Very good. Now this is a tough one. <laughs> this is a tricky one. Who wants to have a go at this? Um, I'll have a go. I said I said it could be a type one regatta. Okay, excellent. In, uh, V1 and V2, but I don't know how you tell how many millimeters it's elevated. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're, you're absolutely right. It doesn't have the um, it doesn't have it doesn't have the, uh, the the squares on to indicate that. But yeah, it does look like a, it does look like it's it, it could be a type one. But you're you're absolutely right. It's it's very difficult to measure it, but it looks like that to eyeball it. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Very good. That's the first part. Next thing, what rhythms can be seen? And then um. After that, I said ventricular tachycardia. Good. So which bit's ventricular tachycardia? Um... So we've got three bits here. We've got the first beat, then we've got this bit, and then it changes. Yeah. So we've got the first section, the second section, and the third section. Which bit's VT? The third section. Excellent. Very good. And is it monomorphic or polymorphic? Polymorphic. Excellent. Polymorphic VT. Very good. Okay. So you're doing really well here. 
So what's this second section then? Um, not too sure. It looks, looks like a lot is going on. It does look like a lot's going on, doesn't it? Okay. Um, so does anyone else have, does, does anyone else have any suggestions? I put ventric ventricular fibrillation. Okay, for the, for the second section. Okay, so um, I, that's, that, that's a thought. The ventricular fibrillation tends to be completely chaotic. So you could argue that this looks a bit like the F, or you could argue that it more, looks more like polymorphic VT. It can be a slightly arbitrary distinction. But this section here, it looks, it looks pretty organized and regular, doesn't it? Um, and every QRS complex looks, looks the same. Okay, so to give you a clue, if these are the QRS complexes here, the, if we're looking in V1 here, We've got these broad, deep V's in V1. What do you think that little thing is before the V? That's a pacing sure. spike. A pacing spike, absolutely. So pacing spikes going on here. Okay. So what do we think this is here? This is a paced rhythm here, isn't it? We've got a paced rhythm here that's pacing pretty quickly. And if you look really closely, it paces, 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 paces. And then this last one paces these ones pace even faster. So it paces and then paces really, really quickly, okay? So this is a tricky one because we've got three rhythms here. We've got sinus rhythm to start with, with the Brugada pattern. We've got a paced rhythm here that suddenly paces really quickly. And then we've got polymorphic VT, okay? So the reason we've got that is because one of the things that you can do for people with Brugada syndrome to see how at risk they are of experiencing arrhythmias, it's a little bit controversial about how, how, how meaningful it is, but one of the things that you can do is you can deliberately um, pace their hearts quickly in something called an electrophysiological study, a VT stimulation study. And if you pace them, and then the last few beats you pace even faster, in people who are vulnerable to ventricular arrhythmias, you can induce polymorphic VT or, or a monomorphic VT or even VF. So, yeah, so this, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one, a bit of a bit of a head scratcher, but that's what's going on here. Sinus, paste, and then into, uh, in, into polymorphic VT. Very good, guys. Well done. That's excellent. All right, then. So that's the homework from, uh, from the week. You all did excellently. So let's have a look at long QT syndrome. So long QT is another one of our inherited arrhythmia syndromes. This time it's um, got often caused by variants in genes that encode potassium or sodium channels. But the variants that you get in, in, in sodium channels will be quite different to those that are, that are, that are causing Brugada syndrome. Occasionally you can get overlap, but in general, those that cause long QT syndrome cause an a gain of function, they increase the amount of sodium flowing through, particularly at the, the, the what's called the late sustained current, whereas those in Brugada syndrome tend to cause a reduction in the amount of sodium flowing through. Um, potassium currents tend to cause a gain of function in um, uh, potassium channel variants are generally gain of function in, uh, in, uh, in long QT syndrome. It predisposes to polymorphic VT or specifically torsade de plant, just like this. Um, you can, as well as inherited long QT syndrome, you can also, it can also be acquired by other things. So, for example, some sorts of drugs tend to prolong your QT intervals. Um, if your electrolytes are off, so if you've got a, um, if you've got very low potassium levels, then that can cause it as well. The diagnosis can be tricky because there's, there's overlap between normal and disease. Everyone has their own QT interval. Some, um, in general, um, women have slightly longer QT intervals than men. Um, and some people have relative, some people with, who don't have long QT syndrome can have QT intervals at the upper limit of normal. On the other hand, people with long QT syndrome, some get very long QT intervals, but some of them, they can have long QT syndrome, but when they're, when they're at rest, their resting QT interval may actually form, fall within the apparently normal range. So there's a bit of overlap there, which can make diagnosis tricky, which is why we need to think about these things carefully. So the, the cornerstone of um, how we're going to diagnose this condition is measuring the QT interval. Now, there are several ways that you can do this, but what we're going to focus on is the tangent method. There are arguments about which way is best, which way is most accurate, um, which way is most representative of the underlying pathophysiology. But the, uh, for better or worse, the tangent method is the one that has been most widely adopted. <clears throat> 
And so that's one we're going to focus on. What does it mean then, this tangent method? So you can see here, we've got our PQRST, we've drawn in an isoelectric line here. What we've then got is we've got our, we've got our T wave and we've looked for the point at which the, there's the maximum slope, maximum slope of the T wave. We've then drawn a line that's at a tangent to that line, a tangent to the maximum slope of the T wave. We then look for the point at which that tangent line intersects the isoelectric segment, the isoelectric line, and that is our endpoint. So we start from the beginning of the QRS complex. We end at that intersection between the tangent and the isoelectric line, and that's our QT interval. That sounds a bit complicated, but actually it's not too bad really, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through it in a little bit more detail. So when you're measuring it, ideally you ought to be taking the maximum value from all 12 leads, because if, you're, if, you, if you measure it in all 12 leads, you're going to get slightly different values in each of those leads. And ideally you ought to take the maximum value and record that as your, um, as, as, as your QT interval. However, there are, some, um, there are some caveats to that. Sometimes the T waves can be pretty low voltage in some leads. And if the, if the T waves are pretty flat, it can make it very difficult to get an accurate measurement. So a better way of putting this would be, take, would be to take the maximum value from all of the leads in which you can be confident you've got an accurate value. In general, the, um, the, a lot of people, if then, ideally you should be taking it from all 12 leads, but um, if you are going to look at it more quickly, you would tend to focus on lead two or lead V5 as they're more likely to have generously sized T waves and you're less likely to see U waves, which is an additional de deflection that comes after the T wave. So here are some examples because not all T waves look the same. So if we've got our standard textbook pattern, we've got a P QRS complex T wave and then a U wave afterwards. Measuring here is pretty obvious and, and, and pretty easy. So we're not taking into account a U wave. We're just going to use the T wave. Okay. The, what gets a little tricky sometimes is deciding whether it is a T wave or whether it is a U wave. Here it's pretty obvious. It's the T wave. It goes all the way back down to the isoelectric line, and then it starts as an as a, an additional deflection afterwards. It's pretty obvious that this is a T wave. This is a U wave. What about here? Here it doesn't quite come down to it doesn't quite come down to the isoelectric line. However, this second hump here is clearly an awful lot smaller than this one, and this and therefore we'd normally define this as a T wave, and this is a U wave. Here we've got a notched appearance to the T wave. This bit's much, um, but it's uh, we're, we're drawing our we're, we're we're drawing our tangent down, incorporating this this larger hump, and we're going to draw our tangent down here because we we're pretty confident that this represents the T wave here. Thankfully, with the tangent method, we don't need to worry about this because this section clearly is much steeper here. If we've got inverted T waves, then once again we can we're, we're going to follow it up to the uh, to the isoelectric line, but we're just going to use the, the 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 negative portion here. We're not going to look at any overlap that, that occurs afterwards. And similarly here. Um, on the other hand, if we've got a sort of a biphasic T wave and the T wave is and, and the positive portion is much larger than the, than the negative bit, we're going to tend to use that instead. So as you can see. It's quite a simple idea. You draw, you draw the line, you draw your tangent, and you see where it meets the isoelectric line. But if you've got funny looking T waves, it can be a little bit of a judgment call about which of these slopes you're taking. So 99% of the time, it's going to be pretty simple to work out. If you've got funny looking T waves, sometimes you want to ask an expert because uh, um, it can be a little bit tricky. And sometimes it's a bit of a judgment call. As you'll see here, we've got this funny formula that's marked here. You've got, we say QTC equals QT divided by RR. What on earth does that mean? <clears throat> well, we've got our absolute QT interval, which is the measurement that we're going to get um, from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave, wherever we're defining that. The only problem with that is that the QT interval tends to change with heart rate. 
your heart, as your heart rate gets faster, your QT naturally gets shorter. So if that's the case, how do you go about comparing the QT interval between someone who's got a heart rate of 60 and someone who's got a heart rate of 90? The way you do that is by using the QTC or the corrected QT interval. The QT interval corrected for heart rate. There are lots of ways that you can correct for it. Again, for better or worse, the most commonly used um, uh, correction that, that is used at present is the is, is what's called Bazet's formula. It's a pretty it's it's pretty simple. You measure the absolute QT interval, and then you measure the RR interval. The RR interval is the time between two QRS complexes. So it's it's a measure that you you, you can get. It's just it's, it's like a different way of expressing the heart rate. So if you're going to measure the heart rate in beats per minute, the RR interval in seconds is going to be 60 divided by the heart rate. So QTC is the absolute QT interval divided by the RR interval measured in seconds. So this is the sort of this 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 is the sort of graph that you get with it. So as if you if you have um, if you're if you're measuring a series of ECGs, all of which had an absolute QT interval of 450 milliseconds, the corrected QT would look a little bit like this. So it's not it's not it's not quite a straight line. It's a slightly uh, it's a slightly curved line. So as a worked example of how you'd work something like this out, if you measured your absolute QT interval on an ECG as being 400 milliseconds at a heart rate of 80 beats per minute. If the heart rate's 80 beats per minute, then the RR interval is 60 divided by the 80 beats per minute. So the RR interval is going to be 0.75 seconds. The corrected QT interval is going to be 400 divided by the square root of 0.75, which is 400 over 0.87, which works out as 461 milliseconds. OK, so if you want to do this, you can work it out by hand if you really want to. Or there are plenty of online calculators or apps or you can set it up as a formula in a spreadsheet or you can do whatever you want to do. Um, uh, but there are, there are lots of things to make it to make, to make it easier. But it's important to know what the corrected QT interval is, what this QTC is, to know the difference between the QT and the QTC. And there are uh, important things to bear in mind. So the next question is, what happens if we don't have regular a regular heart rate? So uh, we, we know that we've got our normal sinus rhythm, but frequently, frequently we see people with atrial fibrillation. If the QT interval changes with heart rate, well, the, in atrial fibrillation, the heart rate is changing with every beat. So what do you do then? Well, there are several ways you could approach it, but again, the most commonly used way to... Um, uh, to account for a varying RR interval is to take the corrected QT interval for the shortest RR interval that you can see on your ECG and the corrected QT interval for your longest RR interval and then take the average of the two. That's a rough and ready way of, of, of establishing it. So the next thing to think about is that um, long QT syndrome isn't just one entity. We talked about it being um, caused by, often caused by variants in sodium and in potassium channels. Those account for the three most common subtypes of long QT syndrome. There are quite a lot, um, but the, the three most common types account for the vast majority of patients. And the ECGs that you get with these um, with these subtypes um, often have some, some some typical patterns. Now, not not everybody with um, long QT one will have a, a pattern like this, or long QT three with a pattern like this. But these are these are the, the sort of the classical descriptions to um, the, the, that can get that can give you a clue for things, and are worth mentioning if you're going to describe these things if you're if you're reporting ECGs. So the T waves in long QT one, you get a prolonged QT interval associated with broad based T waves. So the T wave starts pretty early on 
and goes right the way to the end. It tends to be big and broad. That's the typical pattern for long QT1. On the other hand, for long QT2, the classical pattern is that you get notched T waves. Rather than it just being a straight up and down, we get a notch in the T wave here. For long QT3, you often get a very long isoelectric segment before your T wave starts. So compare this, compare long QT3 to long QT1. Here, the T wave starting pretty much straight after the, uh, the QRS complex, whereas here in long QT3, you're getting this very long isoelectric segment before you get a, um, a T wave at the end here. So those are the, those are the, um, the, the, the textbook descriptions of what these things might look like. So here are some 12 lead examples of them. So you know, if we've um, here, you know, 12 lead ECG, we've got a relatively long QT interval here. And it's, and the, I think you can agree that the T waves are pretty broad based. If we go about measuring the QT interval, so as we said, we could. Well, the ideal way to do it is to measure it in all twelve leads. But if you're going to if you're going to do it quickly, then the uh, then the leads to look at would be lead two and lead or lead five, lead V five. So here we've got lead lead two. So let's do some measurements. So first of all, we're going to draw our line for our isoelectric. We're going to draw our isoelectric line here. I think it's about here. We're going to mark the start of our QRS complexes. Sorry, for next we're going to draw our, uh, our, our tangent. So if we find our maximum slope of our T wave here, and we draw a line coming down from there, we're then going to draw a line. We're going to mark our intersection here with the isoelectric line. And we're going to calculate our interval here. So our absolute QT interval measures out at about 490 milliseconds. So we've got 200 milliseconds for one big square, 200 milliseconds for another big square, plus 40 for this little one, plus 40 for this little one, maybe slightly less than 40, and then a little bit more here. So that works out at about 490 milliseconds. Our RR interval, if we measure it out, comes out as about 0.88 seconds. So if we put it through our calculator, we end up with a corrected QT interval of slightly more than 520 milliseconds. So the normal range for a QT interval is certainly certainly less than 480 milliseconds. Um, and, uh, and it's convincingly pathological if it's greater than 500. So we've got a, we've got a convincingly long um, corrected QT interval here associated with broad-based T waves which fits with a diagnosis of a long QT1. Let's look at our next one here. So here we've got this notched pattern in our T waves here. We've got a notched pattern here. If we zoom up on lead V5, we're going to do the same thing again. Isoelectric line, draw our tangent, draw our markers for onset and offset. So our absolute QT interval here comes out at about 460. RR interval of 0.8, which gives a corrected QT of, again, over 500 milliseconds. If we look at this one here, another example, this is an example of long QT3. And here, you see we've got our long isoelectric segment before we get to our T wave here. So once again, isoelectric line, tangent for our T for, for the for the end of our T wave. Put our markers in. Our absolute QT interval here comes out as about 560. Our RR interval is 0.93 seconds. So getting close to 60, 60 beats a minute, which means that there's not that much of a correction this time. So our corrected QTT is a whopping 580 milliseconds. Okay. Right, so these are what our these are what our ECGs look like in long QT syndrome at rest. 
But sometimes, as we talked about, the um, QTs um, in some patients with long QT syndrome can look relatively normal at rest. They might be only borderline prolonged or, or, or within the normal range. So how do we diagnose these patients then? Well, one of the other things that, that, can, be, uh, that can be really helpful is seeing how the heart rate responds to exercise. And not just the heart rate, but also how the QT interval responds to exercise. And in patients with long QT syndrome, those QT dynamics, the way the QT interval responds to exercise, are different to those in normal people. I haven't got these slides quite right. Well, here we go. So when we're looking at QT and exercise, the way that we, what, what we often do is we often put people on a treadmill. And the standard, the, the, the standardized exercise protocol that we use is something called the Bruce protocol. Uh, named after Dr. Bruce, an eminent cardiologist from way back when. So the way that it works is it's a gradually increasing exercise protocol that starts out as a slow walk on that's on, on the flat. And gradually every three minutes, the treadmill gets a little bit steeper and a little bit faster. You can measure the exercise intensity in something called METS and it gradually every three minutes steps up, steps up, steps up and keeps on stepping up until someone gets exhausted or, or something happens. So you get a period of increasing exercise, but then you keep on recording the ECG during, during the recovery phase. And the thing that has been found to be most helpful in identifying patients with long QT syndrome is looking at the ECGs during this recovery phase after exercise. So normally, in, uh, in, 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 in someone with um, uh, a normal heart who doesn't have long QT syndrome, we'd find that the QT interval looks pretty normal here at rest. During exercise, the heart rate speeds up and the QT interval gets shorter, as we, as we know that it should do. And then during recovery, the, uh, the, the QT interval should pretty, pretty, pretty rapidly shorten again. That's what's supposed to happen in someone with a normal heart. In someone with long QT syndrome, <clears throat> it doesn't work out quite, quite like that. So here we've quite convincingly got a, a longer QT interval at, um, at a longer absolute Q and QT interval at, at baseline. You can't, we can't see what the heart rate is here. So it may be that the corrected QT interval is relatively normal, um, but we can certainly see that during exercise, the, uh, the, the QT interval shortens, but during recovery, that's when our corrected QT interval becomes much, much more abnormal. So the four minute recovery mark, recording ECGs four minutes into recovery is a particularly good way of identi identifying patients with long QT1 and long QT2. And there's a little algorithm that you can use for these sorts of things. Um, this is one of Andrew's papers from back in the day. Uh, talking about how if you've uh, you're, you're with your four minute, if you look at your correct acuity interval at four minutes and 445 milliseconds is a, is a pretty good cutoff for um, identifying those who are, uh, those who have long QT syndrome with those who don't. And if you want to, if you're, if you, if you want to have a predictor for whether they've got long QT1 or long QT2, you can see what their correct acuity interval is at one minute recovery as well. So these are helpful sorts of things to do. Now, as with a lot of um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of these things, um, you can also get associated features. Now, one of the things that's, that's built into the diagnostic scoring system is this phenomenon called T-wave alternance. So if you look carefully at the ECG here, you can see that the T-waves in these chest leads are varying on a beat by beat basis. So if we look at V2, if we highlight V2 here, you can see that on every odd beat, the T waves are down, but on every even beat, the T waves are flat. You get this inverted, flat, inverted, flat, inverted, flat, repeating pattern. Fortunately, the pattern gets broken because you've got a PVC in here. But this, this Alternating pattern, T wave alternance, is uh, something that can also be seen in, um, in, in long QT syndrome and can be a helpful diagnostic feature as well. Um, it's, there are other conditions that can cause T wave alternance, so it's not super specific. You can also get it if you've got 
a really sick heart for other reasons or if you're in the middle of a myocardial infarction or something like that but um but it's something it's something helpful to look for it's an interesting feature to to look for if you're look if you're if you're reading ecgs to see if you can spot it you don't see it very often um you it's it's more likely to be seen in a very very subtle form um, which you need a um, sort of computer aided interpretation to help you detect but this big microscopic t wave alternance is, uh, is 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 much less common but it's pretty striking and quite interesting when you do see it so if we've got a couple more examples of um of measurements of the qt interval so here we can here, here we can see um, pretty pretty easy to see when we've got a, a, a normal T wave, but sometimes when we've got these unusually shaped T waves, it's a little bit trickier. But we're going to rely on the principle of drawing our tangent, drawing our isoelectric line, and putting in our markers. If you've got funny shaped T waves and you're not quite sure what this extra deflection is, then sometimes seeking advice from uh, from a QT expert is often a helpful thing to do. There we go. And 